Hello, my name is Pam Hall and this is Earth News. Today's guest is Peter Sinclair. Peter, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, gee, I'm a lifelong uh, Michigander and Midlander and uh, I'm currently working as a videographer specializing in uh, energy and environment issues. Okay, what was the path you followed to learn about climate change and climate science? Well, that's a long story. The short answer is that for the last dozen years, I have been um, working with, uh, interviewing, learning from uh, some of the world's best known scientists and engineers on this question of climate change. And uh, what I'm most proud of is that uh, when they see the videos that I produce, uh, they're still willing to return my calls. Uh, and uh, in fact, in the last seven years, they've started taking me out uh, into the field with them in places like the Cascade Glaciers and the Greenland Ice Sheet. And then actually working with science teams, uh, following these folks around to see what they do, uh, having them answer my questions, and then going to scientific conferences to conduct even more interviews. Uh, uh, has been gradually filling out my my experience and my uh, uh, grasp of this incredible global problem that we have uh, because the climate not only is changing it has changed and we're dealing now with a, a situation that's uh, unprecedented in human history. I agree. A majority of Americans now understand that climate change is real and human caused how bad is the problem? The problem is bad. Um, what I'm finding is that, uh, say, 10 years ago, I was spending most of my time pushing back on misinformation and disinformation about climate change from people who don't want to accept the science uh, or want to distort the science for their own reasons. In the last two or three years, I've had to spend a little bit more time kind of talking people off the ledge a little bit because, uh, because yes, the problem is bad, but everybody needs to understand that there is a lot of really extreme kind of catastrophist rhetoric out on the Internet and YouTube in particular that would lead people r immediately to, to hopelessness. And the problem is, is, is bad, but it is not hopeless, and we are not powerless. There's a lot of things we can do. That's, that's excellent. That is, thank you for that. Why should anyone care about what happens in the Arctic? Well, as I said, I've been now six times to the Greenland Ice Sheet, uh, which is um, three times the size of Texas. Uh, it's uh, almost two miles deep ice at the deepest points and uh, it's of concern to scientists because um, it is melting. Uh, it's melting at an increasing rate and there is uh, something like uh, 22 feet of sea level rise potential locked up there in the ice. So even a small movement of that ice sheet uh, has huge consequences uh, politically and economically and coastal cities around uh, the planet. And then of course Antarctica is also a concern and that's ten times the size of Greenland. So we're looking at uh, extreme potential impacts from sea level rise but also uh, as Arctic sea ice melts, and so this is the ice that's actually floating on the water, um, we're opening up bigger and bigger areas of, of Arctic Ocean water, that is affecting our, our weather and, and the weather extremes that we see here in, in the temperate zone. And I think this past winter uh, was a pretty good example of that for us here in the Midwest. And many areas are uh, still trying to recover and are, ask any farmer about what kind of a spring this has been so far. Uh, Many scientists feel that these kind of extremes that we're seeing are related very much to climate change and to what's happening in the Arctic. I'm not near the coast. Does sea level rise affect me? Well, yeah. 
because uh, when you go to a place like Miami, uh, Miami is extremely vulnerable. And uh, I think just about anybody who understands the issue knows that Miami as we have known it uh, is not going to survive the next 50 to 100 years. It, it, it might change, but the Miami that we know it, uh, it really cannot continue because sea level, even under our best efforts, is probably going to rise uh, at least a couple of feet, maybe a meter or more uh, in this coming century. And uh, so if you factor that out over our entire coastal area, that means a lot of people are going to have to move. And um, so that's going to be a tremendous burden for us all as taxpayers. And it's also going to be uh, a, a social issue as a people, uh, many people who could possibly be economically severely impacted by losing their homes, losing their businesses, are going to be migrating to other places. Mm -hmm. And um, have some of the places that they're going to be coming to will be the upper Midwest and places like Michigan. Right. How is climate change affecting us here in Michigan? Well, Michigan is uh, favorably positioned because we're kind of buffered from a lot of extremes by being nestled in the Great Lakes. Um, but what we're seeing that's probably easiest for people to identify is uh, this area of the upper Midwest has seen an increase in large precipitation events. And that could be snow, it could be rain. Uh, most often it's been rain. So we're seeing uh, more flooding events. We've seen them right here in Midland. Uh, it's been a, a discussion uh, over the last couple of years uh, in the city council of what to do about uh, the increasing incidence of flooding events that are affecting neighborhoods uh, that in the past have not been impacted by these events. Some of this is due to development uh, around the city, like the mall area, uh, but some of it is simply due to the increased uh, frequency of these extreme precipitation events, and it's going to be a very costly fix for communities like Midland and, and many others. <coughs> Are there solutions to climate change, and where are we in pursuing those in Michigan? There are solutions. I mean, the, the, the main solution, of course, is that we have to stop uh, burning fossil fuels like coal, uh, oil, and gas. And uh, we have, uh, of course, uh, a booming uh, wind and solar energy industry in Michigan and across the country. I'm particularly excited that uh, mid-Michigan is right now in a major build-out phase of uh, particularly wind energy, but we're also seeing a lot of solar uh, start to come on. And this has been an incredible benefit to rural communities. Just south of us in Gratiot County has been now for about eight years the site of uh, quite a large uh, array of wind turbines. And folks in the surrounding communities have had a chance to look that over pretty carefully. And they're deciding that they would like that for their communities as well. So we're start going to be seeing uh, more wind turbine development, uh, I think, soon here in southern part of Midland County. But also uh, to the west, uh, further in Gratiot County, to the north in Isabella County, and, uh, and points to the south as well. So. So that's uh, a huge impact. Uh, Michigan is also uh, an epicenter for the transition to electric transportation. So in the next five to 10 years, we're gonna see uh, a paradigm shift in what people's expectations are of uh, their transportation. And it's gonna be, it's going to happen l as quickly as television or cell phones or flat screen TVs or any of the other uh, technological innovations that we've seen, people are going to see superior technology and they're going to adopt it uh, really quickly. Um, there are many other things that are probably coming in the pipeline depending on how uh, 
our representatives implement these ideas that are, they call the Green New Deal and how many of these ideas we, we push forward. But uh, uh, there are many, many pathways to uh, uh, emitting fewer greenhouse gases and also trying to draw down the greenhouse gases that are already in the atmosphere mm -hmm. through changes in agriculture, agriculture and uh, forestry. Well, it sounds like an opportunity for jobs and, and green energy, which is exciting. It's good for people and it's good for Earth. Um, so what can we personally do about climate change? Well, you know, uh, people always ask this question, what can I do? And, and it's, a, it's a critical question. And I, in the past, I've always talked about, you know, using more efficient light bulbs and upgrading the insulation in your house. and you know, perhaps driving a more efficient car, and these are all important things, these are good things to do. But uh, what I most often tell people now is, first of all, talk about it. You know, if you're concerned about climate change, uh, we've got pretty good research that there, are a, a lot of people are concerned, but they don't talk about it because they feel like maybe they're alone. And what you should know is that people are concerned about climate change. They do want to talk about it. And in particular, you should talk about it to uh, your representatives, to people in the media, newspaper editors, uh, to your friends on social media, uh, but also in, uh, in your churches, in your garden clubs, in your, uh, at the water cooler, and uh, wherever you meet with your peers because we're going to have this national conversation and we need to have it before uh, some, uh, some of the really serious impacts uh, arrive. How can I learn more about climate and what is a reliable resource? Okay, that's a great question because um, there's a lot of misinformation about climate change. Um, you know, if you, if you want a good resource, uh, NASA, has a great page, climate.nasa.gov. And if you really want to get, you know, what the current uh, science data says in, in the most understandable and most reliable form, that's a really great place to go, climate.nasa.gov. Um, I produce a monthly video for uh, a blog called Yale Climate Connections, which is out of Yale University. And so, um, that that's another uh, good place to go. That's uh, very well well vetted, uh, reliable information. Um, and I would say, be very careful about some of the more sensational uh, claims that you see, say on YouTube videos and things like that. Particularly when they're produced by people that you don't know who it is. Uh, because uh, a lot of folks have been led, led astray either by information distorting the science or imp imp information exaggerating, uh, you know, what, what the impacts are. Either downplaying it or... Or, or, or yeah. overplaying it, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell us a little bit about Green Man Studios? Well, Green Man Studio is just, is basically me <laughs> in my basement. Uh, with uh, 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 computer monitors and, and editing uh, uh, suite that I have there. And uh, I've been uh, amassing literally hundreds and hundreds of uh, interviews with some of the, the really top level scientists and experts in this field. And, um, uh, and I try to keep people uh, uh, informed on on uh, some of the, the research topics that uh, people are looking at at the highest level. And my own uh, approach is uh, I, I try not to insert myself too much in, into the productions. I, I let the experts speak. And then my job is to sort of craft it into uh, messages that uh, lay people can understand. Well, thank you for being a guest on Earth News, Peter.
Save our city of Flint. 